Hello, I'm Gene Ovenick uh, with uh, Hoofcare Today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about navicular disease. And I think if we understand a little bit more about its progression, I think it'll be easier to understand where we're at today with the actual navicular disease process. The thing that is, uh, was apparent years ago when we first started recognizing navicular disease was radiographs were used to, to see any bony changes. Uh, and surprisingly enough, there was fewer changes than were expected. The fact is that uh, spurs to the navicular bone, some surface changes uh, were recognized, but uh, as time went on, the uh, approach to treating navicular disease was basically thinking that there was a flexor tendon uh, pressure to the, to the navicular bone and that the angle was low, the heels were low, the toe was long, so raising the angle would be of some help to relieving some of that tension. And later, they, uh, the process of rockering the toe was a common practice. And often an, a, a wedge pad was introduced into this package and because there seemed to be a uh, underrun heel condition, bringing, bringing the back of the shoe out farther to the rear in the form of an egg bar was a common uh, prescription for treating navicular disease. And it was partially successful and, and, and not always uh, the best results. And now we realize that hoof preparation was a part of that. But nevertheless, the prescription given by veterinarians to farriers was that. And the thinking with the farriers it was at the time, and I remember this some 30, 40 years ago, was that, well, if you wanted to raise the angle, uh, why would you trim any of the back of the foot off uh, and then add a wedge pad? It just didn't make sense. So I think as we l see a clearer picture now, we now can look back and see why those processes were less than effective for the most part. And then as time passed, we saw horses with similar symptoms in the way they turned and the way they blocked out and stuff. That, uh, that had no significant changes to the navicular bone. So we thought at the time that there was, uh, that this was on, the navicular disease was on its way. So the term pre-navicular syndrome was, was then implemented into the diagnosis. And again, as time went on, we started seeing similar symptoms and catching it a little farther ahead, meaning horses would stumble some, they would land toe first, and their uh, turning was, was less than uh, comfortable. So we started calling prenavicular syndrome, trying to get ahead of the curve, as you might say. But nevertheless, the prescription for shoeing was still the same, and the hoof type was still consistent. It was a longer toe and uh, the heels were for the most part run under and that seemed to never really change. Just the shoeing was basically the same as well. We just tried to get ahead of it with a egg bar shoe wedge pad and a few things like that. Until such time as the MRI came into play and some techniques with ultrasound we found that uh, actually what was happening long before in the prenavicular syndrome in his, in his situation, we found that there was some soft tissue, meaning the collateral ligaments uh, and the attaching tissue that attached these bones together, particularly around the navicular bone, that these were the structures that were being injured and the symptoms of navicular disease were similar. We now know that leverage was a key component in uh, the creation of navicular disease and a precursor in navicular syndrome. The attempt to resolve the navicular uh, progression was in part in the right direction, simply rockering the toe, raising the heel, and, uh, and looking at it from that perspective, not realizing that the hoof capsule distortions kept us from becoming very accurate in being able to, to resolve the problems. Those cases where more improvement was made were actually seen to 
uh, reconstruct the foot in a different way, meaning they recognized the, that there was actually something going on with the hoof capsule that they approached it differently. And I think that's what's important, and that's why the mapping and the, and the, the hoof balance that we see today is critical to the prevention of navicular disease, but also to the, to the treatment of navicular disease as well. So now that we understand more about the structures that are involved in the progression of navicular disease, we now can get ahead of that curve. Now, the approach from reducing the leverage on the front by rockering the toe was a noble attempt to get to where we're at today. We now realize, though, that we probably weren't even close to getting control over that function of the uh, leverage. Uh, because the lever arm was still far too forward of where the coffin bone is. And now that we have a better understanding of that, we are able to get ahead of that curve. What is in the forefront of our um, uh, treatment protocol today is that not only is the deep flexor tendon involved, but the collateral ligaments, the ones that hold the joints together from side to side, are as important and possibly more in harm's way with what we do with our horses today because of, us, of our, the, the activities that we do in turning circles and things like that. And I think that as we look at, at the whole navicular idea, we now look at this as being a soft tissue problem. And the, the navicular disease is just way down the road from uh, earlier episodes of damage to the surrounding tissue to the navicular bone. The, the format that we use in, in treatment is basically getting the foot back underneath of itself, engaging the soft tissue, the intricate parts of utilizing the frog support, the digital cushion, all of those components in a heel first landing that will inevitably support the navicular bone and help in the alignment of the P2 into the coffin joint. Those are critical issues that, uh, that we now understand uh, from a preventative perspective that we had no clue about before, didn't seem important because we focused primarily on the hoof wall and for the most part didn't realize how important the rest of the components of the foot are. What is it that the horse owner needs to get ahead of the navicular curve? Now that we understand more about it and the progression of it, realizing that it's about soft tissue and leverage, we know that horses that labor in their tasks uh, will land toe first and they oftentimes will stumble and quite often horses forge. We used to just justify that because it was seemingly nothing we could do about it. But now we understand that they're all precursors to an inevitable problem. So in light of that, you'll, you'll see your horses with these symptoms. I suggest that you take, pick up the horse's foot, uh, go through the mapping that we're gonna offer you, and you'll generally find that there's more foot ahead of the widest part of the foot than there is behind. Whether the horse is shod or barefooted, it makes no difference. The effort that it takes to, to leverage over the top of a longer than normal foot will promote all of these other symptoms like stumbling, landing toe first, and forging. So that will give you some information about how to get ahead of the curve and stop the inevitable process of navicular disease or navicular syndrome. Mm -hmm.